Hi there, welcome to Chemistry 3007 at the University of Western Australia. This is a, the second set of lectures uh, about approximate wave functions following on from basic quantum mechanics. In order to understand these set of lectures, you'll need to have gone through those lectures first. Okay, so let's get going and see what this is all about. Here are the topics. We're starting off from the time independent Schrodinger equation, molecular Hamiltonian, uh, Born Oppenheimer approximation, and then we're going to start going through some approximate wave functions and using all the mathematics that we have developed in the last set of lectures to eventually get up to the Hartree Fock equations. Um, actually, we won't get up to that, You'll, that will have to be derived by you in an assignment and mp2 theory and the expressions for the mp2 energy will also be derived by you in an assignment. So that's what that's about and let's start now with the time independent Schrodinger equation. So as we said before in quantum mechanics um, we need a wave function to describe how the properties of the system evolve in time and that equation is time dependent it depends on time but most of the applications that we do uh, involve the ground states or excited states of molecules or systems and they don't change in time very quickly um, so how do we get that time independent schrodinger equation um, well, we have to start from the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, which looks like this in atomic units. It's h psi equals minus i d psi by dt. So this is a first-order differential equation uh, for the wave function in terms of time. And the Hamiltonian here involves um, the second derivatives with respect to space. So it's a differential equation. This is minus i times h bar. Should be there, but in atomic units, h bar is equal to 1. Okay, so we can simplify this time dependent equation um, using separation of variables. And we're going to use this idea of separation of variables all the time in the future when we do these approximate wave functions. So to obtain the time independent, Schrodinger equation, what we do is we separate the wave function, which is a function of many particle coordinates, which I've just written as x in bold here and time, and we separate it into a product of two functions, one of which is phi, only a function of the position coordinates, and the other, which is uh, capital T, which is a function of only the time coordinate. So this is called separation of variables. Uh, into two different functions and if we do this separation it turns out uh, that this equation simplifies into two parts so we substitute that in so here we go h times psi which is phi times t equals minus i times d psi by dt which is phi times t okay now in order to make progress what we have to do what we can do is we notice that if the Hamiltonian doesn't depend on time, um, then we can take the spatial coordinates, uh, the, the spatial function out the, uh, the time function out the front, because h doesn't involve any time variables. So we can take this t function out the front. It commutes with h, and we can put it out the front. So that leaves h phi this part depending only on spatial coordinates. And likewise, uh, we can take the phi part on the right-hand side outside of the front of this partial derivative because it doesn't involve any time coordinates. So as far as time goes, this is like a constant. Okay, that's fine. Well, we can go further. We can now divide both sides by phi and both sides by t. So that uh, whenever we do algebraic manipulations, we have to do the same thing to both sides to maintain the equality. So that essentially brings the phi over to the left-hand side, and this t goes over to the right-hand side. Now, we have some things, because on the left-hand side, we have a function only of x, and on the right-hand side, we have a function only of time. 
Now, two functions of different variables can never be equal unless they're equal to constants. For example, if this was equal to x squared and this was equal to t squared, they wouldn't be equal. They're function, two different functions of two different variables. However, if both of these were equal to a constant, such as e, uh, that would be allowed. So we, uh, we set both of the sides of these equal to a constant. That's the main trick when you do separation of variables. So these equations, the original equation now splits into two equations, uh, one which is h1 on phi, h phi equals e, which we write as h phi equals e phi. For the spatial part only, this is the time-independent Schrodinger equation, because now nothing in that equation depends on time, assuming h doesn't depend on time. The second equation uh, can be solved. That's minus i1 on t d psi by dt equals e, or d psi by dt equals positive i e times the function t. And that is an easy equation to solve. Uh, the solution is some constant times e to the i e t. I'm going to assume the constant's 1. And we have solved the time-independent part, uh, the time-dependent part of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation with this separation. So assuming the Hamiltonian doesn't depend on energy, uh, the wave function looks like this. A spatial part depending only on coordinates, sorry, a coordinate part, depending on space and spin coordinates in a time part. Now, what, what do we notice? The wave function always depends on time. Psi always depends on time. The so-called time-independent Schrodinger equation only solves for this part of the whole wave function. But there's always this oscillatory part in the wave function, even when the Hamiltonian doesn't depend on time. However, if the Hamiltonian does depend on time, for example, it, it includes terms uh, involving an oscillating electric field, maybe coming from a photon, then we can't use this procedure. We have to solve the full time dependent Schrodinger equation. Um, so that's basically it. And in that case, um, we the time dependent wave function will change in shape over time and if you look on Google you can see some of these pictures of the wave function changing in time. It's essentially showing how the energy or the probability density uh, of the particles shifts as a function of time and we call that wave packet dynamics. It's important because when you see this wave function changing in time you see how the energy is distributed over the system and it may lead in fact to the ejection of an electron or the absorption of a bond uh, or it may lead to some emission of radiation or a breaking of a bond. So this time dependent stuff is important but we're not going to deal with it in these lectures. We're going to deal with wave functions of this form which is sufficient to get the energy levels of the system. By the way this constant E is the energy of the system. See you later.